Welcome to Pod Crushed. We're here without our co-host, Sophie, and sorry, nor our um, nameless, faceless, uh, rather he's not nameless, he's the, the fa our faceless engineer and editor, uh, David, because they have had a baby. Her name is Anais Mika. Um, I have to say, I've seen people with newborns recently and like 18 month olds and I you know Dom and I have uh, we have the spirit of wanting another one but I have to say when I look at parents living through the first year or two years I'm like no I don't think so I don't think so again <laughs> I think we've Fair. I think we've reached a threshold uh, I just want to say that I met Anais last night and you did she, yeah I did I, I cooked them dinner oh, wow. and I took it over and I got to oh, hold her great. briefly, and she's truly one of the most beautiful, like, newborn babies Aww. I've ever met. And so sweet, and she has this thing. Sophie and I were talking about it. She has really delicate finger movements, and it seems very strange for a six-day-old baby to do the things that she does with her fingers. Mm. And I was like, am I, Is your? does your baby have, like, something interesting with her fingers? And Sophie was like, yes. She looks like she's, like, a little sorceress. It's it's the strangest <laughs> and sweetest and cutest thing. So, anyway, sending lots of love to Sophie and David and their sweet, sweet baby. You know, I not to, not to undercut that, but let's undercut it. I remember when our youngest came out, three, three years old now, uh, he was zero at this point, He's um he, he he did something also kind of jarring where his hands were like the, he he was like hmm. uh like as though like what have I done <laughs> what like like this, this sort of uh grave yeah. uh, crazy scientists or um uh what's the word I'm looking for mad scientist mad scientist yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like inventor inventor yeah crazy scientist you no, birthing mad scientist. a mad scientist feels on brand i feel like that yeah, could was, be in his future uh, no i know and he and he actually until he was until he was like a year and a half he would do mm. these things with his hands where he'd be like ah and like look up at them mm. very wide-eyed and it was pretty interesting uh mm. so maybe we have at least two wizards as a part of the I think so. Pod Crush clan. That makes sense. I like that for us. Now, but speaking of wizards, uh, can I ask how your dogs are? Uh, my dogs are well, but I'm going to pivot because I don't think we've ever <laughs> announced our merch on the show, and I think we should. Oh, we have yeah. a new lineup of merch. We have long sleeve tees, hoodies, a crew sweatshirt, which is my personal favorite. We wait, took wait, some of your favorite. Merch? It's out. It's out. It's already out? It's already out. You can buy it Holy in time crap. for the holidays. It's super cute. It's super cozy and snug. I actually would encourage this. And I think you should buy some. So, listeners, you can head over to podswag.com slash podcrushed and check out our new line of merch, which I think is our better line of merch and lots of sweaters for the season. No slight to our last line, but yeah, we're getting better. We're getting better. We're growing. Um, unlike our ability as co-hosts here... <laughs> Uh, why don't just, we just why don't we pivot to our guest? Yeah. Uh we have we have Matt Reif. He's a he's a huge comedian now. You'd know him from TikTok, also his specials, Matthew Stephen Reif and uh OnlyFans. And now uh he has a new special on Netflix. Finally made the jump. Matt Reif Natural Selection. So uh we had a far reaching conversation. Mm-hmm. Um, for for a comedian who's blowing up, he's very sweet, and and um, we talked a lot about of all things ghosts. So you'll be into it. <laughs> Don't miss it. I will say this: we've had many stand-up comics on the show, and Matt is the first one that I felt like his real, his his in-person energy. Although I was on a screen, but like his non-comedian energy was very different than his stand-up energy. It was m like much sweeter, and like more youthful. So we have sweet, sweet Matt Rye for you. <laughs> he's, I'm trying to think of like he's Matt Ripe, something oh, like that. Uh, like uh, Matt Ripening? Uh, no. That's, that's, that's bad. That's We're not the comics that's worse. he is. Yeah. Uh, yeah. We'll, Sorry, we'll just, we'll I just apologize to everyone. Stick around. Welcome to Pod Crushed. We're your hosts. I'm Penn. I'm Nava. And I'm Sophie. And I think we could have been your middle school besties. Swapping study notes and debating whether today's cafeteria food might give us food poisoning. <laughs> So we'll start at around about 12, 11, 12. And okay. if you want, if you want to roll into it with childhood context, that's fine. Cause okay. that does help. But you know, um, 
We're just curious. Like we can, you okay. know, we can dig in. But let's just start. Like twelve year old Matt Rife. Okay. A snapshot. Who was that? Person? Twelve year old Matt Rife would have been in seventh grade and just moved back from Texas. Actually, um, I used to have a stepdad who my mom and he and my mom were married for. Oh, God, probably about 15 years, I would say. And his parents moved down to Texas, a very, very small town, like an hour south of San Antonio. We lived in a trailer park for like a year down there. He just wanted mm. to live closer to his family. But I, at the time, was obsessed with reptiles, and Texas is full of them. So okay. I was constantly, constantly like catching snakes, like cotton mouths and rattlesnakes, because oh, wow. I thought it was like a fun thing to do. And it scared my mom to death that she thought I was going to get bit. I would like literally come in the house and have like like those little green gecko lizards like on my arms and stuff. I was such a oh, weird cool. kid. Wait, Matt, I how do you catch animals. a rattlesnake? I'm very by, curious. By its by its tail, <laughs> not by the head. Not for by sure. the head, really. Yeah. yeah. Well, when you're that kid, when you're a kid, you're so naive. Like you're jumping out of trees and stuff. You're jumping down flights of stairs. Like you have no idea like the reality of injuries and how you could actually kill yourself so easily. Wow. And because I was so obsessed with these animals, I just saw them as these cute little things. I did, I never. I knew they could bite me, but I never, like, really weighed the risk, I don't think. Yeah. I was more so just fascinated by it. And I was also, like, a huge, um, like, crocodile hunter fan, mm -hmm. which he, I think he died when I was 12. Hmm. Was that hard for you? It was the first, like, celebrity <laughs> death that I ever felt, I really? think. It was Aww. him, and then not again until when Robin Williams passed away. Wow. Mm -hmm. I was very upset about that. I had a show that night as well. So I was uh, I had all the feels for that one. Wow. Mm -hmm. So we lived in Texas for about a year. My mom legitimately was so scared I was going to get bitten by a poisonous snake that we had to move back to Ohio where I was born, raised, uh, lived the rest of my life until I was 17. Um, moved back up to the original small town I'm actually from, but like an even smaller sub town of that. Like this town we moved to had like uh, probably 40 people in it like it was just like an, an, wow. an abandoned like mill town that house oh, actually wow. got demolished i think I, I went back a couple of weeks ago just to drive through it and that house isn't even there anymore what do you mean just to, like you were you you were home were you or were you driving through touring or something uh touring i was okay. in, i was going from dayton dayton ohio up to cleveland and it was like 20 minutes out of the way and we're, we're doing a documentary a lot of, about a lot of stops on this tour and okay. we had the crew with us and we were like well it'd be a huge missed opportunity if we didn't drive through my hometown to see where i'm like yeah, from definitely so we stopped by there and that house actually and this is all 12 by the way this house we moved into was the scariest house i had ever lived in in my entire life i'm a huge believer in ghosts and we're gonna get into that definitely. Oh really? Nava yeah. Oh, <laughs> well, I'm I feel so like, excited. I feel like Nava's gonna I want like to. Oh thank God. Okay, yeah. I could talk about yeah. this for hours. <laughs> okay, this great. was the first house that like legitimately struck fear into me. You know, when you're a kid, you'd be afraid of a closet or under the bed or whatever. Mm -hmm. But like this entire house just terrified me. It was a old farmhouse, three stories. Um, when we moved in there, the basement was like one of those brick walled basement that had like jars of. I'd say 50-year-old, like, uh, preserved vegetables and everything all wow. over the walls. It was wow. so old. And something about this house scared me so much. We lived in this house for probably seven months, including a summer. I think I slept in my bedroom four times. Oh. Wow. Could not stand it, dude. I was yeah. terrified. I either slept on the couch or, like, in my sister's bedroom, like, on the floor. I was terrified of this house. It was the first time... It's the only experience in my life that I, I, to this day, don't know if I was having, like, sleep paralysis. And if so, it's weird that I had it at that age and never again since then. But I remember a moment. I know this is sidetracking into paranormal. No, we love it. it. Has to do with Side, 12. Take us to the paranormal, Matt. I, I remember, so being afraid of this room upstairs that I was in, about five months in, actually, I moved my room downstairs to the computer room, which was, like, probably half the size of this recording room and i've liked it that it was small because nothing could hide in there like okay. it was just it was enough room for my bed and my dresser and my tv that's about it okay. and it was like a, an old old closet this wood was so old and painted over so many times but i remember one morning i woke up i woke up and i opened my eyes and there was just like an old woman i suppose you saw with like kind of a, a thin like black veil over her face and if, like, the table is me, was just kind of over top of me with, like, a mouth just, like, open like that. And I remember, like, not really moving or knowing what was going on. And then she just turned, got up, turned, and, like, walked straight into the closet. And the reason I don't think that was a dream was because 
I just started my day. Mm. There was no like uh, uh, after or anything. I remember just getting up and starting my day, I suppose. So how did how you wait? How did you navigate the rest of that day? <laughs> were you not That's like losing the weird your thing. mind? Like, I, I don't I don't think I registered what state I was in. I don't uh, maybe it was a dream, maybe mm. it was sleep paralysis. I, I may, and maybe it really did happen. And maybe as a kid I convinced myself there's no way that happened. I must yeah. have still been dreaming. Wow. But there's something about this house. The, even the bathroom was this massive bathroom that was like probably the size of this entire room, that entire room, and a little bit more. It was a huge bathroom for no reason. Hmm. And I remember like showering in the shower every day for like seven months that we lived there, and like constantly having to look outside the curtain because you always th- you always thought something was in the bathroom with you. <laughs> Terrifying. So this is all happening for age 12, just a very scary year of my life. Aww. I'm curious how your 12-year-old mind was thinking about um, the afterlife, mm. death, and just your relationship to, like, okay, what's going on? You know, yeah. what's the nature of reality? Was it leading you to, and I, I would gather, I don't know, you come up like, sort of marginally Christian background or something? Not at all, actually. Not at all. Okay. Not at, the only church I ever went to growing up is whenever I, I stayed over at, like, a friend's house Saturday night, and they're like, you can stay over, but we're going to church in the morning, and I would, like, be forced to go with them. Okay. Yeah. But, like, what was your perspective then, as much as you can remember? As I a 12-year-old, I mean, it was never at the forefront of my mind. I don't think I ever tried to Except deep when dive the into ghost it. Was yeah, yeah, exactly. It literally right. forefront of my face. But, it, but you were on the I, forefront of its mind. Matt, so. yeah. Don't even say that, okay? Because what if it's still attached to me? I don't even okay, want to think about be. that right now. I, d- I don't know. I my, my dad passed when I was about one and a half. And my mom always used to say that I, I would see him when I was a kid. Like, I would, like, stare oh. into, into nothingness and be like, mm. Dad, like, right there, oh. right top of the stairs or whatever. Oh. Obviously, I have no memory of that. But it makes sense if you buy into the, 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 the younger kids are more susceptible to interactions um, with, with spirits, I suppose. Yeah. So... I will say just a brief aside. I haven't even told Nava this. Uh, our three-year-old just said to my mother, his grandmother, um, something about he he was he. So my my mother's uh, my mother had older twin sisters, mm-hmm. one of whom died at five years old. Now this obviously like rocked the whole family. And, uh-huh. You know, I mean that's like its own it's its own entire story. But. Um, our three-year-old just started saying to my mom, it's like, and she died by drowning. She drowned. <sighs> and the twin witnessed this, by the way. So it's like, that's a, oh that's a profound thing, right? That's Pool, a very... lake, bathtub. Lake, oh. lake, yeah. Mm. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, and he just started saying to my mom the other day, like, your sister, your sister, she's in the water. <gasps> You know, he was like, she's in the water, and you're sad because she died. You know, he, he like, he's, and he, I don't even know. He, he doesn't said, know that story, Penn? Well, okay, so I'm, a, I'm, I'm both a very practical person, very much a firm believer in everything that science is, mm-hmm. is revealing and proving about the known material world. Also a believer in the soul, the eternal life of it, uh, some kind of spiritual reality that is hard to define. Um... I don't know that I, I I think it's 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 plausible that we would have spoken about this and he would have heard it. But he's three. But, but the but specific three, way that he yeah. would have heard it, remembered it, and then repeated it the way that he did is like, you know, it's who knows. I think mm. it's like I'm I'm equally open. I'm like, ah, that could have just been us discussing something that I don't recall. And we, it's not like we talk about this a lot, by the way. Mm. Two um, things. First of all, you're you're incredibly well spoken. You're such a hot teacher. Um, <laughs> and second, uh, you got to get rid of this kid, dude. Yeah, <laughs> you, this, right? this, this is how right. every scary movie yeah. starts. I know you love him. You got to make another one. All right. <laughs> you got to send him on his own, dude. This yeah, kid fair. is possessed, fair. man. No, He's it, already it, talking to the dead. It, well, it, it was. Uh, <laughs> And the way he did it, by the way, and now I should know this too, it was like very, very offhand and casual. Yeah, it was like, that's and we wild. all just heard it. And, we, and then I looked at Dom and I was like, have we, did we talk about that? No, I, to him we? being casual about it is actually yeah. even yeah. scarier. If he was like, I, I see, you know, auntie or whatever, yeah. that's his fear, I would appreciate because yeah. then he understands that maybe what he's saying, he's not <laughs> supposed to chill. see, but being nonchalant about a dead person over there, yeah. that's creepy. To yeah. Me. yeah, yeah, yeah. That well, is terrifying to think yeah. about. I, so I actually, I cut you off. What I don't remember what part of your story you were in the middle of. Uh, no, I think it was just that the kids are potentially more susceptible and to seeing see that dad. realm. Oh, okay. right. You were asking about your any other spiritual proclivities. What was your perspective Mindset on the afterlife? Mindset at 12 on the afterlife and stuff. Yeah. Um, 
Yeah, I don't think it was ever a prominent thought process, but my entire life, I have always kind of been fascinated in the paranormal because of the because of the answer, I suppose. Because the uh, biggest question of life is really what happens after, right? Mm-hmm. Besides what, what's our purpose, yeah. what happens after? Nobody quite knows. So this is a, a very random thing I like to do for fun. I actually do ghost hunting now, like as a side fun really? thing. I've been, I've been all over the like world doing go- it. Really? Yeah, yeah. I've been up to amazing places. I oh. went to the... One of the more notable ones, we went to the Cecil Hotel, like, right after the documentary came out. We got... Uh, Who's that? Where's that? Oh, Netflix did a whole documentary. The Cecil Hotel's in downtown Los Angeles, okay. and it's, uh, like, Richard Ramirez, the Night Stalker, lived there. Like, it has such a history of so many, like, of just murder and drugs. Yes. And it's such a bad place. I've always been fascinated because I felt like if you, if you were to ever find some kind of provenant evidence or interaction with a spirit from the other side... I feel like that would answer a big part of your question, right? And if you had yeah. some kind of inkling totally, as to yeah. what happens once you do pass away, I think that would change your life. I think that yeah. would change how you live the rest of your life if you knew there was an afterlife or Agreed. got some kind of information about it. Agreed. So I've always been kind of fascinated by that and just open to open to learning. Yeah. So as a kid, I never like looked for it, I don't believe, but I was always kind of open to it and always very interested in it. Can I ask uh, the sort of obvious question, like yeah. have you – have you th- did losing your dad so early influence that do you think did that did, i mean it's funny you say that a, f- a friend of mine said that on a podcast one time and it's it's super dark just a heads up he goes you ever think you ever think that maybe you love ghost hunting so much because you're looking for your dad he yeah. was like cut to me at the end of a, a jail cell and i'm like he's like trying to i'm trying to learn how to ride a bike for the first time or just, i'm like playing catch with right, nobody right, right, right. which it, it's no, quite possible no yeah. i i mean it's touching to me i mean because yeah. it's like yeah yeah. I always wanted to do a movie about that situation, actually, because my dad died when he was 21. Oh, my yeah. goodness, that's young. Yeah, Is yeah, my parents Ross? were very young okay. when they had me. My mom was 19, he was he was 20. Wow. Uh, yeah, well, which in Ohio is late, actually. Mm-hmm. But uh, <laughs> he, so he passed away at such a young age. And that gets lost in my mind a lot of times. Like, my, my mom especially. Like, I, I barely grow any facial hair at all. Mm-hmm. I'm so jealous. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and like a year ago, I was talking to my mom about it. I was like, "Man, I better get, I better get facial hair soon." And she was like, "Well, your dad never had any." I was like, "He was 21. Yeah, <laughs> he didn't really get a full you chance." You outlived your father. I know. Yeah, and I thought that would be a fun movie concept if, like, he came back in some kind of like ghost or like guardian angel form, uh, but he's younger than me. Right. That's right. That such is a, weird a fun concept movie concept, Matt. We have a production company, and we're really interested in the afterlife. Say less. So that's, you know. <laughs> Interesting. Okay, let's collab. Yeah. Let's. I'll have my people. Call your people perfect so you love this but you hate us ast- you hate astrology hate astrology yes, dude let's come get on into that. Yes. <laughs> come on man it's not real there's no I love, way I, love, I, love, I just love how convinced you are and by the way i'm not i'm not discrediting the ghosts and the souls uh-huh. in the afterlife but uh yeah explain the the distinctions you okay see. a ghost we at least associate with somebody who's passed on right mm-hmm. and there's for whatever you believe there's evidence of some kind, right? Mm-hmm. I've had experiences that I cannot possibly explain. This is a phenomenon. Your, your story was an amazing example, yeah. as well as I've I've also had a fun interaction with a medium for another time we'll dive into that blew my mind. Mm. And I'm very skeptical skeptical about that kind of stuff. Astrology, I'm just like, what are the direct I mean, to, I mean, to, be, to be fair, you don't sound that skeptical. <laughs> of mediums, I am. Of mediums, okay, I am. Right, right. Absolutely. Yeah, um, but no, of ghosts, no, I fully believe. Yeah. <laughs> but I believe that somebody could talk to the dead. I'm like, ah, are you a medium yeah. or, okay, you know, okay. or are you a large? Yeah. You know what I mean? Fair. Yeah. Uh, astrology, I'm just like, what are, the, what, are the, what are the direct results? Like you, you look up, you, you say your, your future is like predetermined in the stars. What, what is a planet that's 98 million miles away from you have to do with anything yeah, yeah, yeah. in your active life. No, trust me, I'm with you on this. Yeah. Like, mm-hmm. at least in the fact that so many people Penn is so scared of getting canceled that he won't just come out right and say he doesn't. No, no, because okay. I studied You it. can't get canceled for being against astrology, can you? You can't get canceled Matt, for anything, Matt. Matt, Matt you nice to meet you guys. <laughs> oh, shit. Oh, I'm so done. I'm going to have to perform on Mars, dude. No, no, no. No, 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 because my thing is that I think there's validity to the to the arrangement of the physical world around you when you're born. There's something to that. The arrangement of the cosmos. Surely it has an influence. Everything has an influence, right? <sighs> I don't see how it has an influence right, from so under. far chill, away. Chill, chill, chill. So, so, but a ghost can be in your house. Uh, Mercury's not in your house, dog. Yeah. No, but it's in your second house, bro. 
What's my it's a st- have you, you don't know the language of a, of a natal chart? No, I know just enough to oh, well, convince girls to talk to me. Well, Penn is really into astrology. I, yes, I know just enough how to be a fuckboy. Like, I used to respect him. All right. Right. So, so I did study it, interested in it. And, mm-hmm. and and found a lot of validity and value to it. And then, but I think just the way that it's that it's referenced pop culturally and by most people who reference it, mm-hmm. you know, in the way that you mentioned in your special, like, it, yeah, I'm with you. It's like, I, it, I don't, it bothers me. It really bothers me. Oh, it's because people are basing their entire lives off of it. Yeah. Yeah, I can yeah, get okay. on board and let you believe that, you know, that it's, it has some kind of involvement in your life, but to completely blame where you're at in your life oh, on that, a planet yes. is yeah, yeah. insanity yeah. to me. Yeah. I, and I don't believe that, like, you know, Virgos are only compatible with Leos. Mm-hmm. and Vir- It's just every book I've ever read, like, I fit every single one of the Zodiac signs. Yeah. Everybody does. Yeah. It's just not specific enough There's for me. more than 12 kinds of people, surely. Yeah. I know. I I, God, yeah. I keep forgetting you're such a nice guy and having a prominent career as an actor. So many jokes I want to tell. Yeah, <laughs> but no, no, I'll, no, I'll say Penn's tell career. Them. Tell them all. No, I, I now the pressure's on. Like it's a missed opportunity now. now. Yeah. It, 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 would not have, it wouldn't have lived up to the yeah. hype. It's okay. I'm just going to go on the record and it. say that I'm with Matt. I don't believe in astrology. There's just no way. And you can convince me later. I love the planets. I, I believe that a lot of our ancestral history is built upon that. I mean, if you go back to the pyramids and... Um, uh, what's the what's the one in England? Uh, Stonehenge. Right. A lot of the uh, yes, there's a lot of our cultural structure built off of the stars, but also they didn't have shit else to look at. You right. know what I mean? Yeah. If you had been on <laughs> pre million before a million years before Jesus, oh, the Lord. pyramids would have looked like Ben Badgley. <laughs> yeah. But they don't. They're Cleopatra or whatever somehow, you want to call it. Somehow that has a nice ring to it. Uh, e- get somebody get Egypt on the phone. <laughs> I want to know what role humor and comedy played in your sort of upbringing. How how young were you when you started to really learn that? Um, yeah, <laughs> I think it was probably if we're deep diving, it was. I mean, I was always naturally funny. I guess I would make my my friends and family laugh. Um, but a lot of people have that ability. I think it became prominent probably in high school, which I know is missing our our cue here, mm. but. Uh, I was bullied quite a bit. Not like, you know, I wasn't getting stuffed in lockers or anything, but like the butt of a lot of jokes. Yeah. And I think in that position, you have two options. You can either be wildly embarrassed, which makes it so much worse, mm-hmm. or you can play into it. You can accept what they're saying, and you can also make a joke about yourself and self-deprecate and play into whatever joke they're making at your expense. Mm-hmm. And I think that inevitably sharpened my skills because anybody could make a joke at my expense at any time, and I had to be ready to play into that at any time. So I think that added a sense of like self-awareness and a prominent defense mechanism, I would say. Yeah. But I, I hit puberty ex- extremely late, and I think that made me in- very sensitive to myself until I was probably like 21, 22 years old, and then finally I hit a bit of a growth spurt, started to grow into my face a little bit. Mm-hmm. It hit me very, very late that I, mm-hmm. I, I, I made this joke in my first special, but like I really spent the first 21 years of my life like building a personality right. that now maybe I wouldn't need, you <laughs> yeah, know what I mean? Yeah, so now yeah. I get best of both worlds, I guess, thank God. <laughs> but I was prepared my entire life to just be picked on and like Aww. not attractive to anybody. Like I'd... I didn't get my first girlfriend until I was like 17, yeah. and then I didn't. I had one kiss at 14, and then didn't even like speak to another girl until my first girlfriend at 17. So, I think I think the late puberty definitely played a huge part in that. And again, like if you want to, if you want to talk to a girl and you're you're not good looking by any means, and you're just a scrawny, gangly kid, you gotta have something to offer. If it's not dick, it better be jokes. You yeah. know. Yeah. So, <laughs> one out of two ain't bad. <laughs> Wait, Matt. which one do you have? Oh, uh. <laughs> fuck. I'll see you guys later. <laughs> it's just not in the uh, stars, yeah, you know? Right. <laughs> um, so, so then, so then early on you were comedy was like like let's just let's because that's that's what you do that's is your art form this yeah, is like you could be a performer so like what so how did you what age were you when you really started to discover it so first as like a maybe a way to relate to others but then as its own thing entirely it's like your path yeah. At about uh, 15 was when, was when everything really started. 14, my um, my freshman year in high school was the first I ever, like, realized what stand-up was. Uh, I mm-hmm. fell in love with, like, Dave Chappelle and Dane Cook. Those guys were both at the absolute peak at that time. They were the epitome of comedy. Chappelle show was out. Dane was selling out these, you know, arenas. Mm-hmm. Um, and I just became obsessed with, like, Comedy Central, like, half-hour Comedy Central presents mm, and stuff. Yeah, yeah. So I was a fan of comedy. Didn't really know what it was. I knew it was just people telling jokes in a row for 30 minutes or an hour. 
And then when I was 14, my mom won tickets on the radio to uh, to see Dane Cook live at Nationwide Arena in Columbus, Ohio. You know, it was nosebleed seats, terrible seats, but the show was so impactful for me that I was like, I'm in love with this. Maybe I'll do this someday. And a couple of weeks later, my um, my seventh grade teacher came into the t- came into the home room and said that we we're having a school talent show. So I tried for the first time, and it was not stand up. It was jokes I had gotten on the internet mixed with like impersonations of of mm. people that go to my school. <laughs> it was so bad, but I had fun doing it. Didn't really think too much of it for like another nine months, ten months, maybe a year. And then when I was 15, I I really wanted to try it, and I had heard inklings of like what an open mic was. And the only comedy club near me was about about 40 minutes away from my hometown, the Columbus Funny Bone. So I go to their website and try to figure out what an open mic was. And like most comedy clubs, it's 21 and up. Yeah, so I, I emailed the owner, which is such a weird thing to do. Like now I would not do that. Mm. And I was like, hey, I'm 15 years old. I know you're supposed to be 21 and up to go to this club. Like, I know I'm not old enough, but like if I had a chaperone with me, like could, could mm. I come and do the open mics? And any... Any businessman would have said, absolutely not. I'm not risking my liquor license over a 15-year-old just wanted to tell jokes. But Mm. for some reason, he said yes. And I just started going every week. And I think that's where my confidence started to build a little bit, at least in my own ability to to make people laugh. But it also wasn't a popular thing in my school. Like once other kids at my school found that I was like doing stand-up comedy, I I would get shit for that. Mm. So, I mean, it was kind of just an ever looping circle I suppose of like trying to improve yourself getting beaten down for it accepting like yeah yeah maybe yeah it's so stupid that I'm doing this playing into it and then trying to rebuild and he made fun for it all over again wasn't this was this around the time I, I can't remember where I heard you tell this story but uh Ralphie May yeah like you had this it sounds like a really like he was I mean Maybe it's an overstatement to say mentor or role model. No, I mean, that, that's for, exactly uh, how I would describe it. He was like a big brother to me. Are you familiar with his work? I'm not, like, not the way a comic would be. Okay, fair enough. Ish. I mean, you know, I remember, I remember when he was coming up. You gotcha, know? gotcha. Yeah. yeah, he was, funny story that killed me when I was younger. I was I was 15 when this happened. Uh, <laughs> this is so crazy. I used to do this. So uh, inappropriate. But when I started my comedy career, um, Twitter was still, like, fairly new and prominent to the point where everybody was accessible. Nobody had millions of followers yet. Like I I think Ashton Kutcher was the first person to hit like a million followers or something like that. (laughs) If you guys remember that milestone. Yeah. But it was the time where most celebrities had maybe a hundred thousand if they were really popping. So what I would do is I would wait for whatever comics I was a fan of to come to the state of Ohio, anywhere in the state. And I would just tweet them and be like, hey, can I do a guest spot on your show? I didn't even really know what a guest spot was, but I, I told that's what you're supposed to, like, start with. Mm-hmm. Which is basically you go up and do five minutes between the host and the feature, and then the headliner goes up. Okay. Um, I had never done one before, but I was a huge Ralphie Mae fan. So I was going back, and he was very prominent on Twitter. Like, he would tweet back with people all the time. Mm-hmm. So I, w- I reached out to him. And I was like, hey, you're going to be in Cleveland, the Hilarities Comedy Club, which, ironically enough, I'm going to uh, this weekend. Oh, um, it's about a two-and-a-half-hour drive from where I was from. I was like, hey, can I come to a guest spot for you? And he was like, you know what? Come on up. Why not? But my mom inadvertently ruined it for me, mm. being a good mom. She obviously had no idea what this was about. She didn't know anything about comedy. She didn't know what a guest spot was. She had never even, I don't think she had even been to one of my shows yet. It was mainly my grandpa that would take me. So she didn't know how any of this stuff works. So she kept making me ask him, like, where do we need to go? What time do we need to be there? Where do we need to park? Is there a specific <laughs> place we need to hang out? Do we need to buy tickets? Oh, we no. have, I, have, I kept having to bombard him with questions. And I I hated asking him because I knew it was yeah. annoying. And he called it off. He goes, hey, man, this is just too much. Uh, maybe in a couple years, once you've been doing it a little bit longer, we can do it. And I was fucking crushed. That's mm, crushing. Yeah. And yeah. Probably six or seven months later, he was in Youngstown, Ohio. I reached out again. And it was a theater, actually. Smaller theater, probably like 700 people. But, I mean, but, you know, when you're 15, it's so many people. Mm-hmm. And he let me come up and do a guest spot there. And that was my probably third guest spot I ever got to do. It was my first time I ever got paid. He paid me $100 and mm-hmm. told me a story about how the first guest spot he ever did for Sam Kinison, he paid him $100 to open for him. Yeah. So he was wow. like, you know, just make sure you pay that forward. He, and I've done he, so since then. He opened for Sam Kinison? Mm-hmm. That was his yeah. first? No, yeah. I guess it, it, it No, because Ralphie also started when he was 14. Wow. wow. Yeah, Ralphie okay. started at 14. Dave Chappelle started at 14. And I, start, I started at 15. Uh, so, I mean, good good track record for people who want to start comedy. Yes. Early. That's a try. Because <laughs> right, it, right. it takes years of just eating so many dicks uh-huh. until you're finally like, okay, I, I enjoy this now. Right. 
So he was um, he was such a good mentor in the sense that not only was he gracious enough to, to put money in my pocket and gift me with stage time, but he really he really looked after me and gave me a lot of advice. And mm-hmm. like for example, he had, he had a place in uh, Nashville, one of his houses. And Zany's is a wonderful comedy club in Nashville. It's one of the best clubs in the country. And when I was about 16, I was starting to travel outside the state a little bit to do some shows. And he would let me. I would take a Greyhound. I can't believe my mom let me do this. I would take a Greyhound from Columbus, Ohio, down to Nashville around, like, mid-December. And he would let me open for him. And he would pay me a few few hundred bucks, which at the time was so much money for me, so that I could buy Christmas presents for my family. And then when I finally moved out to L.A., I stayed on somebody's couch for the first two years living living in L.A., and, like, you know, I didn't have any money for groceries or anything, really. It was mostly, you know, like canned soup and stuff like that, grilled cheese. And he would take me to go get these lunches, and he would make me order, like, four meals, Aww. which is, you know, which was, you know, regular for him. Yeah. But for me, I was like, I can't eat all of this. And he was like, no, go home and put it in your fridge. Now you have, you have leftovers for the rest of the week now. So he would basically pay for my groceries for the week, taking me wow. to a restaurant. That's he was so the sweet. nicest guy, man. I wish – he's one of those people that I wish he was around today to kind of see – what's what I'm what I'm lucky enough to be going through right now yeah. and you know hope that he's proud because he was always such a older brother like he was always very worried like he actually told me not to move to LA right before I did he was like yeah. dude don't move to LA till they like till they want you to move to LA which mm. thank god I never listened to that because I, n- I never would have got my first tv show I n- Hollywood never called right mm-hmm. they never called ever until like seven months ago yeah. so thank god i took the chance out there and i remember one time when we were at lunch he was like i'm sorry i told you not to come out here i was completely wrong like around <laughs> the time i booked like my first tv show right yeah so he he was fantastic man you you need you need people like that who actually have like your best intentions at heart and i was very lucky to have that and he what better person to learn from this man would do two and a half hour shows and there'd never be a lull right usually mm. you know if a comic does two hours an hour and a half and people are like okay you better be fucking crushing <laughs> but he yes. would murder for like two and a half hours sometimes wow. three hours wow. and i know i'm talking your ear off right now but one really cool thing he said one time about why he would perform for three hours was because he said most of his fans were midwest working working folk like mid- middle class like hard-working people right who probably mm. work a minimum wage job mm. who probably make you know maybe twenty dollars an hour and he's like, my tickets are usually probably somewhere around 60 bucks, which means it takes you about three hours of work to afford a ticket to my show. He's like, wow. I want to give that time I'm back to you. I'm actually going to I want to make touching. it worth your time. And I always took that away and have to remind myself, like, yes, I'm lucky enough to get a chance to perform, but this is for them. And I always mm. kind of took that with me a little bit. So sweet. I, I, I know. That is ve- that's very sweet and touching. Oh, I mean, both you. from you and from him. I, that, I, that makes me think of the way you do crowd work now. Uh, and just how that is like your, I think some would say your specialty. Thank you. But we do have a little bit more of, Neva, what do you think? Should I know, we... I'm like, should, we have like a couple of classic middle school questions that I think people will really want to hear about from you. Shoot, I'm sorry, we'll I just wasted so much time talking about Ralphie. No, 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 no. no. Is... Okay, the first question, you sort of hinted at it, but people, we love to ask our guests to tell us about their first love and heartbreak. Yeah, my, my first girlfriend. Uh, Victoria was her name. I hope I'm okay to say that. I hope she doesn't get mad. I haven't spoken to her in like <laughs> well, 10 we years. Well, we all know. Uh, perfect. <laughs> You'll yeah. find out. You'll She's let your us biggest know. fan. <laughs> right, right. You have no idea. Um, I was 17. I had just moved to a small town, another small town, north of where I was before. Um, this was my senior year. I had just turned 17. She was 19. She just she graduated the year before I got there. And we met just, you know, I was meeting new kids at the school, and I was very into I, I moved high schools a lot. I, I moved to one high school for three months and didn't talk to a single person. Like, I, I was doing group projects by myself. Wow. I ate lunch by myself. Uh, one, time the, one time the cheerleaders came over and asked if I wanted to eat with them, but I knew it was out of pity, and I was like, oh, I'm all right, thanks, though. Um, <laughs> so I, I moved to this new school. I started to meet a couple of people and, you know, following them. Instagram had, like, just come out, so we were adding each other on there, and then people are posting and tagging. You see who else they follow. And I had found her somewhere on Instagram, and I thought she was, I thought she was extremely cute. So I reached out. I, I think I was the one who reached out first. It was so long ago. And we just really hit it off. She was, uh, she was still in town. She was, you know, taking her year off trying to figure out what she wanted to do. And uh, we just we fell in love for – how long did we date? It would have been – we dated when I was in Ohio for about 
three months. Not mm-hmm. a long time at all. You know, just that that hot, steamy, irresponsible high school love you fall into sure, that yeah. you're like, you know, we're going to get married. <laughs> but then I graduated early. I um, I had flown out to L.A. to take the, uh, the chess beat. Right. So I flew out there, took that, passed it. This was like January of 2013. So I had like five months of school left. Mm-hmm. But I'd already been doing stand-up for like a year and a half, two years. I'd already, I had taken a trip out to LA before. I, I knew it's where I wanted to go. I loved it. I had no reason to stay in Ohio. Nobody in my family has ever gone to college. So like there's, there's no like expectations. Mm. And my mom saw I was making a little bit of money. Like I, I missed both my proms doing stand up. Wow. Like I, like I was very involved with that. I knew it's what I wanted to pursue. So I had, you know, eventually I had to tell her like, Hey, I, I, I want to move to LA. And of course being in hot high school love she was like i'll move out there with you you know mm. I'll, I'll, I'll apply to a college out there there's a couple of colleges out there i thought about looking into it could be really fun so i'm like yeah 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 you know maybe we'll yeah i'll, I'll move out there first i'll, I'll get things arranged I'll, I'll get my own apartment and then uh and then, and then you can you can come out there and we were so in love with, with each other she was a wonderful girl but i was such an insecure mess mm. i was probably the worst boyfriend like i i was I missed her so much, and this was such a small town that everybody knew everybody, and she was a hot girl. Mm. Yeah, right. Like, I, when I went to this high school, I started dating her. Of course, all the guys were like, you know so-and-so's been with her. You know so-and-so's mm. been with her. But I'm like, yeah, I don't, I don't want to fucking hear that, dude. So when I left not just town but the state and moved across the country, I was constantly worried about somebody stealing her away from me. Mm. Like, I, w- I was so insecure. I was... Oh my god, I was so toxic, dude. Like, I if she posted a, a picture with like with cleavage or whatever, I thought she was asking for attention. Mm-hmm. You know, if she she had a fake ID, if she was going out to a bar, I thought she was you know susceptible to guys talking to her and getting her drunk and maybe her making a bad decision. Like, I it was all coming from me. Like, she was probably doing absolutely nothing wrong at all. Mm-hmm. But then her being young, she also didn't let me being out in L.A. and how she knew there was beautiful girls out there and mm-hmm. I'm performing and meeting people, starting a new life. So. We just fought mm. a lot. We argued about potential worries, yeah. mm. you know. So, so it inevitably led to an end probably probably like three months after I was out there. We're probably only together for like six months. But, I mean, we, we really did love each other. That was probably my first love. Mm. I it was my And when I say that, it's because it was the first time I did care about somebody more than myself. Mm. And, I, yeah. and I wanted a future with this person. And she was lovely, and it just, you know, she never made her way out there, and I was so insecure. I, I was just, I was probably making most both of us miserable, just not being able to deal with the long distance. So mm. we eventually broke up, and I was so sad, man, because, you know, I didn't, I didn't really know anybody in L.A., and because I wasn't in a relationship, I wasn't meeting any women. I didn't have, like, you know, I didn't have the rebound ready. I didn't, I w- I didn't have people to distract me. I was just in LA on a couch. Mm. So that was probably my first heartbreak. I, I missed her like crazy. That was really my biggest tie to back home. Um, you know, when you're a kid and you're fresh out of the house, you're, like, you're not missing your family. You're excited to be on your own, but like, right. that's who I missed. Mm-hmm. That was the one prominent like happiness I have back home. And now I left that and I had to start like a brand new life all over. Mm. The mm. Probably the healthier way to interpret that story is like you guys broke up because of a lack of trust, but the romantic in me is like, oh my God, they liked each other so much. That's why they broke up. Like there's something like, you know, just I think, particularly I think two things can be true. I think you can like, I think, I think two things can be true. Yeah. We did like each other so much. We liked each yeah. other so much. We didn't want anybody else to steal the other exactly. person away from each yeah. other. Yeah. But the reality was neither of us probably had anything to worry about. We just self-destructed, Yeah. which I'm sure is more common than I think, but yeah, yeah it sucked, man. Yeah. That was distance. It was. I mean, it sounds like more than anything. Like if you weren't going to close that distance, there was just. Yeah, but it took it took me. How old am I now? Twenty eight. It it took me until now to kind of be the person I want to be in a relationship. Anyways, I mm. I continued to yeah. be um, insecure and and jealous uh, throughout throughout the next uh, fucking close to a decade. Yeah. Mm. It took it took a lot of relationships figuring out what I what I didn't want. And what I shouldn't shouldn't be doing to figure out how how I should act in a relationship and the and the respect that not only I need to have for myself but for this person as well. You know, you the insecurity never went away. If I dated, if I dated a beautiful girl who was I don't this is just a random example a, a bikini mm-hmm. model I'd be worried about her. I'd be full Jonah Hill. I'd be post. I'd be worried about her posting bikini photos. Being like, dude, you're dating a girl who does this. Yeah. yeah. You can't change somebody. It's yeah. so rude of you to try to, to. The reason you liked them in the first place, now you want to change. Yeah. 
that's so selfish. It's you, also, you can't do that to somebody. Yeah, w while I'm with you, it's also like it's kind of textbook as well. The very thing that attracts you is uh, you know, of course the thing that is the greatest challenge. And know? now I'm so much more cognizant of that. Like I I I, I clock all of these things and I really way how I would handle with them before I even begin to uh, approach somebody now because it's 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 not fair to try to change somebody yeah. and I, and, I, and I would try to do that I was trying to I was trying to please myself by getting in more relationships that I would tear myself apart with like I, I wanted something so bad but the thing I thought I wanted wasn't what I could handle did yeah. you it sounds to me like you probably did not have great models for relationships growing up no, like I, like I also include myself in that category. By the way, like my parents divorced, had a very, very tough really? relationship. Yeah, I mean, I think that's very common. But like my parents, it was a very, very, very toxic. And oh yeah, and I think what I'm realizing as a, and I'm, I've now, I've now been with my wife, not married to her the entire time, but as long as this period you're describing, like ten years ago was when we met, just about. Wow. Just about now. And how so, much have you grown since then? Oh my goodness. I mean, well, what I've learned about relationships and mm -hmm. like the true nature of love in a in a in a long lasting committed relationship, and then that extra thing that somehow happens when you get married. I don't know. I think everybody talks about it. It's like you could be to get with somebody, and then you get married, and some thing, and it's significant. is 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 different. And I think if you can convert that, it's like it's a it's a great bounty. And if you can't, then it's like you're really gonna struggle. Somebody somebody said something to me, to me the other day about marriage that kind kind of shook me a little bit. They were they were talking about their their view on marriage and how they were a little skeptical about it. And I love the idea of marriage, mm -hmm. the, you know, the, the ceremony and being with somebody forever. Like I, I love that the the the, the romanticism. Together. Exactly. No, it's still death to us part. No, I'm, I'm out of here, dude. Once I get to heaven, I'm hoeing out, dude. Yeah. Marilyn Monroe's up there. You I'm gonna try to right, smash. Right, yeah. um, she's uh, th 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 this girl said something. She goes. Uh, she said, I, I, I like the idea of marriage, but she goes, I, I, I think it's not necessary. She goes, I don't, she goes, I want to wake up every morning in love with this person because I want to be with them, not because I'm contractually obligated to stay with this person. Sure, yeah. Which kind of shook me a little bit. I was like, at, at the end of the day, that's all marriage is. It's just paperwork. I, yeah, I, I disagree. I, well, okay. I'm in my twenties. I fully agreed. Oh, I just got my lobe go, dude. Just yeah, be, be gentle, yeah. okay? I just got my lobe. <laughs> I mean, I honestly like. I, I don't know that I can name what it is. Uh, I, I think that the, uh, you know, the, the the contract is representative of a different level of agreement. Mm. I think. I mean, I'm just. I don't think that it is literally about. If this is what some make it, okay, fine. That's a, that's a very superficial version of marriage. Mm -hmm. But 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 I do think that it that that it is a, it's a process that's initiated where you are entering into simply just a deeper level of agreement. And yeah. in this capitalist whatever, okay, so a contract is a part of that because yeah. it has to do with what I get inheritance and and rights to, to all this stuff. Sure, fine. But I do. I but I but I'm I'm with you and and so many young people who who feel that way because uh, because I myself very much used to feel that way and i see the i see the logic of it it's yeah. it's um yeah anyway we don't need to get caught wait, up wait, in that. actually do you want to no i, I agree with you oh, oh. i agree with what you're saying I, i'm not ahead, married no, no. but i i feel like i feel like it helps to have I, i'm pro divorce existing mm -hmm. like i think it's important that if two people really you know aren't a match or there's abuse or whatever that you, that you have a way to get out of it. But I mm -hmm. think it is helpful that it's not super easy to end a relationship because also in romantic relationships, there's like so much passion that gets stirred up that sometimes in a moment you can be quite rash and you can blow up something that is actually quite meaningful to you. And I think the fact that like you can't just like jump out of it as easily as other relationships is probably a protection. And That's I recently read this New York Times article, which really surprised me, that said that people who divorce uh, m for the most part, end up unhappier. Like most people who get a divorce end up regretting it at some point, at least if you're talking about their levels of happiness. Like they find that they were happier married, um, which is like not a well-known fact. And I think that that's helpful to know, actually. Like maybe don't jump to divorce, like take some time, you know. Well, so, I think yeah. also like, look, if the human being is a, is a like, okay, I'm going to step out. I'm going to abstract for a second. Yeah. If science is showing us principles about the, about our, about the universe, mm -hmm. which are, by the way, like governed perfectly everywhere. You mm -hmm. know, the sun is operating on the same principles of gravity as in the middle of a nebula, a black hole, and mm -hmm. right here, right? Like, so there's some kind of, there, there are principles operating in relationships. You can call them moral, spiritual, philosophical, whatever. But like, you know, the fact that we understand trauma, the fact that we understand happiness in its scientific 
you know, sci in, in science is revealing that, like, oh, there are also universal principles here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, like, the human reality has, like, universal laws, you could say, that we're kind of uncovering. And You're not going to convince me astrology has to do with this. <laughs> no, 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 You're not no, going to no, do no, it. No, no. No, He's like, and no, all Geminis I'm saying, end up divorced. What, what I'm saying is that, like, we talk about marriage and divorce. Okay, fine. Let's just, like, take that out of the equation for a second. Okay. I suspect that we're happiest when we're bound in a deeply trusting relationship. Mm. Yeah. You know, that's what we are supposed to get from our parents. Mm -hmm. Tragically, mm -hmm. many of us don't, mm -hmm. you know. But it's meant to be there. Mm. Like, we are happiest when we're in... And, by the way, not just not just romantic, like, friendships. We're, yeah. we're happiest in deep, long-lasting committed authentic relationships i think it would be disingenuous to suggest otherwise we're finding all these ways around that okay fine whatever there's so many social factors but then um why the hell are we talking about this i don't remember i don't know but yeah, i want to ask we, matt a random follow-up question <laughs> it was at his first love and heartbreak but matt you you joke a lot about relationships that's like a you know it's fertile ground in your stand-up set oh, yeah. I, I i love i love it when you get into that territory but i am curious for you what turns a situationship into a relationship? When are you willing to actually make that commitment? Um, this is a vague answer, but just connection. I think, like, you, you, I think it's your initial instinct as to how much how much time you want to spend with that person. You know, if you when you mm -hmm. leave that person's side, do you miss them? Can mm -hmm. you not wait to hang out with them again? Like that to me is kind of the first sign. But if I'm like, oh, all right, on to the next thing that I have to go do, hang out with my friends, work, whatever mm. it may be, and I'm not thinking about that person, then I'm like, ah, eh, maybe I'm not there yet. But I think you take that jump when you want to spend time with that person. You have genuine interest in their life and where they want to go, mm. where they've been, who they are right now, their opinions on things, their insights on things. Um, I think once you get a general interest for those things, to, to me, that's when I start to pay more attention and, and want to take, take things up a notch, I think. Mm. You talked about your girlfriend on a recent podcast and your face like lit up. So if you wanted, I would just wanted to give you a chance Don't to share a sweet story about a sweet story about your girlfriend or a funny story. How long you been together? Can I ask? It's been almost seven months. Yeah. But I've, but I've met her. I met her a year before we uh, got together. Oh, God, I hope she's okay with me saying this. Well, it's not. It's, it's not. Can it's I not, can I ask her when we leave here? Yeah, and if yeah, she doesn't yeah, like we can it, cut it, it if she's not Absolutely. comfortable. Okay, yeah, okay. Let's do that. To that um, when I, I met her on set uh, doing an indie film in Mississippi okay. that's hmm. su ultra, 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 ultra low budget film. <laughs> that It was a friend of mine was directing it. I had nothing else going on. He was like, do you want to pop in and do two lines? I was like, I got nothing else going on. Okay. So I fly to Mississippi and I'm in the makeup trailer and she walks in. She's wearing this yellow dress and she was instantly like the most beautiful thing I had ever seen. Like by I was like up, I could not stop staring at her in the mirror, and then I heard her voice, and she's British, and I, it was just it was just everything about her was so perfect. I was obsessed instantly, and we got to have the day. I'm getting to know her a little bit. We have a, a couple of uh, real small scenes together, and uh, she, you know, I'm obviously starting to shoot my shot a little bit. I'm asking, so you know, you have a boyfriend or whatever, and she did. She had a boyfriend, <laughs> <sighs> but I was dead set. Uh, I, I've still, I, I, I tried so hard, it, which was, which was really tough because she was so sweet. Mm. She never led me on, never once gave me an inkling of hope whatsoever, but. Mm. Oh, that's right. Because you met her long before you started to. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yes. So this is a really, uh, wholesome, civil, Aww. you didn't. Kind of. No. <laughs> <laughs> on her part. Yes. On her part. Yes. But we continued to hang out just as friends on set, you know, okay. and, and yeah. I wasn't making anything weird. I wasn't pressuring sure. anything, but. Yeah. Coincidentally, the more we talked and hung out, the more we found out we had like so many things in common. Like her favorite mm -hmm. song was my favorite song. Her favorite activity was my favorite activity. Can like I, we just can have I the ask same. What that song is? Uh, Are you okay? <laughs> well, it's it's well, sorry. It's one of our favorite songs, "Dancing okay. in the Moonlight." Yeah, okay. that's a sweet song. We, yeah, who's that by? Then? Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, yeah. such a good song. Uh, it just as we talked for the next couple of days, it was so so this. Oh my god, this is the most simp thing anybody has ever done. I'm gonna get so much shit for this. I was only supposed to be there for two days, right? But in Mississippi, they get tornadoes, mm -hmm. so they kept getting tornado warnings every time, like on, on my uh, the time that my flight was supposed to leave. And the director would be like, "Hey, do you feel safe flying out? We're getting a lot of delays, <laughs> saying or no. I can change it to the next day." And I go, "Change it to the next day. Yeah, I have more. I, I can spend more time with her." Mm. Mm. So that's the third day. Same thing happens the next day. 
you feel comfortable flying? <laughs> getting a lot of delays, but we can probably get you out of here. I go, ah, I'm not really, I don't really feel safe. Uh, I'd, I'd like to stay here an extra day if I could. So I stayed an extra like two days just to keep hanging out with her. Aww. Just because I, I was, I was really trying to, which is such yeah. a shitty thing to do. She had a boyfriend. I know that. I know that. I know that. He probably hates my fucking guts. Um, and we, I, I ended up going back to, back to LA. We had a wonderful connection. Um, just really good chemistry off the bat. I was obsessed with her. We get back to L.A., and she had wanted to come out to a show. But so, obviously, when, when she got back to L.A., I called her. I was like, hey, do you want to come out? And she was like, you know, I, I have a boyfriend, and I, I just don't think it's appropriate that we'd be friends because mm-hmm. obviously you like me. And I was like, you know what? Fair enough. It, if you don't like think it's, it's appropriate. Yeah. yeah, it was bad, <laughs> dude. Uh, so I didn't talk to her for a year. I didn't reach out. I didn't DM her. I didn't like any photos or anything. I was like, she... She was in this relationship, and I was mm. after I tried, uh, I was gonna respect it, you know. And then um, they they broke up, like probably ten months after I think. A couple of months went by, and the premiere for that movie that we did happened. And I didn't go to the premiere. I, I, had, I had shows that night or something, and uh, also I was in it for like two lines. I wasn't right, you know right. thrilled to go, and I knew she, I, I assumed she was probably gonna be there, which is gonna be awkward. Mm. And sure enough, she DM'd me and was like, "Hey, why aren't you at the premiere?" And I had a terrible haircut at the time. I had these long ass <laughs> sideburns for this. And uh, she was like, Your sideburns made an appearance, but you were nowhere to be found. And I was like, Oh, I didn't know I was invited. I didn't assume you'd want me to be there. And she was like, Well, things have changed. And I was like, How so? She was like, Well, we can hang out and we can talk about it. So um, the first time we had Smart hung out in girl. over a year, she came with me. I had, I had two shows like two hours outside of LA in Ontario. Uh, they have an improv out there, but you know, traffic takes like two and a half hours to get out there. And I was like, I'm. F- I'm not really free tomorrow, but if you want to come to a show still, I have two shows tomorrow, but think you'd have to spend like eight hours with me because I have to leave like 3 p.m. I won't get done with the shows till like 1 a.m. Mm, yeah, right. And she was like, okay. And she came and we hung out like every day since then. Oh, that's great, Aww. man. So yeah, I mean, it was a shitty thing to do to pursue her why she had a boyfriend, but uh, I don't know. I had a But hunch. then you backed off. Then you backed off and it paid off. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I, yeah. You know, if, you know, if it's yours, it'll return back to you, right? Yeah. Or so you hope. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. But to answer your question from earlier, Penn, I think that's a very, I think it's a very uh, viable point to, to to hone in on. Is that, yeah, I don't, I don't think I had uh, a lot of like positive relationship examples yeah. in my life because I didn't have my dad. Right. And then my mom and my stepdad. My stepdad was awful. Like we right. never liked each other. Like he was like the stereotypical mm. like. Picture a cartoon version of like a stepdad, right? Like beer cans all By around the, way, the house. I'm a stepdad. Are you really? And, and, and this the is no, hottest you stepdad. You're a porno stepdad. That's what you are. You're, you're not, you're not you a get, cartoon stepdad. You can stepdad. say whatever you want about stepdads, but I'm just letting you know. That I, I knew this about you and I suspected it, so this is why I'm asking. You did yeah. know this about me. Well, and I, it's, yeah, we have to do our research here. We're not we're, we're not just pretty faces. I didn't know you were a stepdad. Please don't fuck my mom. <laughs> Please don't. Please don't. Oh my God. You but here's the thing. You you have a very gentle energy about you. Like you're very, you're very comforting. Aww. We've just met for the first time today, and I'm very comfortable around you. We never had that, my stepdad and I. Like we, mm-hmm. like we avoided each other at all costs. Like he was an alcoholic. We had nothing in common. I loved sports. He loved NASCAR. He loved cars. I loved you know football. Um, but he was also like you know was like very like physically abusive and like he and my mom would argue a lot because mm. like you know he'd whoop the shit out of me and then she would scold him for it, and then he would yell back at her mm. so that was kind of the environment in my house and with my grandpa my grandpa was really my dad like he, right. he was my father figure I, I, I miss him so much and he and my grandma got a divorce when I was about I don't know, like 11 um and I love and I love I love my grandma I don't have anything bad to say about her but she she had cheated on him Mm. And this destroyed him. Like he, they had just bought a house together like mm. five months prior mm. and he sold everything. He sold mm. every single item in the house that she ever touched. Uh, he sold the house immediately, um, lived in apartments for the rest of his life until he got a house at the very, very end. Um, so I think inevitably that instilled in me that like, you know, you can't trust anybody, even the closest mm. people to you, the people who you think are your, are your, you know, your, your foundation and the people you should trust the most and, and, and really lean on and, and not ever have to worry about can still leave, yeah. you know? Mm. So I think those being the two prominent examples of relationships in my life, I think it just inevitably embedded distrust within me. Cause I'm like, you know, if somebody can be married for 30 years and then cheat on you, it's like, well, anybody, mm. you can get cheated on at any time. Totally, man. Yeah. So, 
you know, I, I, I feel for you on that. You said your parents got divorced. It's like, yeah, I think you do. I think you are supposed to have that example. And unfortunately, with the, with the divorce rates being as high as they are, not a lot of people get that. And you can't blame it on that. You know, obviously, you have to do your own work and eventually recognize. Maybe that's where it stems from, mm. which I'm very thankful to have, have done that at this point in my life. I wish I had done it sooner. Um, but, yeah, that's why I think when it is finally time for me to have kids, it's like I, I have to know this is the person. And I have to know we have a healthy working relationship so that this kid doesn't get passed down the exact same bad habits I might have had. Totally, mm. yeah. So if you do want to be my stepdad, I'll rethink things. <laughs> I'll see you at Christmas. I think that's what we're going to get out of this podcast. Yeah. I have an abrupt pivot. We ask every, we've been so lucky to have several comedians on the show, and we, I think we ask almost every comedian to tell us their favorite joke that bombed on stage. You still bomb? Ever? I haven't bombed in a while. <laughs> uh, favorite joke that bombed. Give me one second to think about this. Okay. Or just a memorable a memorable experience of bombing on stage, if you can't remember the joke. Memorable experience. Um, my third time ever doing stand-up. My first two times went well, so I had a lot of confidence going into it. It was very fun. I was like, oh, I think I, I can experiment more, right? Mm -hmm. And I had the, I was trying out this joke that was very similar to Dane Cook's, uh, like his, his very famous bit about, like, about overly crying, about, you mm -hmm. know, I, get, I did my best. I did my best. It's, it's, a, it's a brilliant bit. And this was definitely an impression of that, basically. Mm -hmm. so it was a bit where the whole joke, the punchline, was an impression of me overly crying, right? And I'm I'm on the floor, just, ah, ah, ah. like this was the punchline, right? Mm -hmm. To this day, I've never felt such internal pain, <laughs> quite like getting up off the floor to silence. To silence. Oh, Ugh. that's hard. To this day, that yeah. is the most scarring bomb yeah. I've ever had. How old was that audience? You know, like what's the that audience age, is probably thirties to forties, I would say. And you were fifteen. Fifteen. Yeah. Aww. What were you thinking? <laughs> I was trying anything. I didn't know. Yeah. I, dude, for my first six months of stand up, I, I didn't know what it was. I, did, I had no idea about building a set. I, every for the first six months, every time I got on stage, I would do a new five minutes because I thought that's what comedy was. I thought everybody just did a new thing every single time. I, uh, which now I get whenever people see me repeat jokes. Like you know, they come five months apart from each other. Like, well, you did that back in you know February or whatever. Mm -hmm. I'd be like, yeah, well. That was the beginning of me working on the joke. Now it's a newer version of that. But like that's mm. you, you build the set. Mm. I had no idea. So at the time I was just trying anything, you know. And, and Dane Cook being such a, a prominent influence on, on yeah. my my early stand up, he was very physical. So I was like, oh, I maybe maybe I should try to do something like that. Mm. <laughs> and to this day, you cannot get me to do, like, commit to a huge physical act out. Yeah. Were audiences mostly older? Like they must have been. Like yeah, yeah. I it's um, a comedy audience. I never did. Yeah, because I'm doing comedy clubs, so everyone yeah. has to be 21 and up. Except for myself. So I always did jokes like for adults. I never did like, oh, school was crazy today. You know when you're at recess? <laughs> you know, and never never did anything like that. No, that's that. what we do. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you have a yeah. whole podcast dedicated to the things I never talked about. That's yeah, so funny. Exactly. Uh, oh, fuck. What was I, I going to say? Um, you, you, d you did jokes for adults. Yes, which I think helped me transition to like when, once you hit like 24 – you no longer have the novelty of, like, he's a kid. Right, Give him right, a break. Right. You know, once you're, like, 20, 23, 24, people start being like, okay, what do you have to say? I paid money mm -hmm. to be here. Like, you have to be funny now. Yeah. So I think that helped my transition because a lot of comics who start early, they did do that like, kind of kiddie material, right? Or, or were, all the jokes were about how they were young and the kid in the room. And I had some jokes about that, about my age, because you have, you have to acknowledge the obvious. But it wasn't everything I had. So that making that transition over to being like an adult comic wasn't as hard for me because I've always I've always tried to make my set as as universal as possible. Mm. I hope that answers the question. Yeah. But yeah, bombing a lot early for sure. No, picking yourself off off the ground to silence is definitely Dude, uh, that's, the silence was I can definite. feel that. I can definitely feel that. That hurts so bad. Now it's funny because I'll. Now jokes don't bomb so much as they'll be divisive because, like, I, like mm. you mentioned, I, I like dark humor. I, I like to push the boundaries. But that's my sense of humor, you know? Like, if people come to the show and they leave going, oh, that's not what I thought it was going to be, that's fine. Mm. You're not then, you know, it was a mis miscommunication. Maybe I'm not the comic you thought I was going to be. Maybe you don't love my exact style of humor. That's fine. But you know what I did find in, in taking that risk? People who really fucking like my humor. Mm. And if it's 30% of the crowd, awesome. If I'm doing, you know, if it's a 3,000 seat theater, I mean, I just made a thousand new like hardcore fans for the long mm -hmm. run. Right. I'm not in it for like, you know, 
the short term, this one tour, and then that's it. You know, I want to build lifelong fans. And you can only do that by being true to yourself and doing your style of humor. You know, you can't you can't build longevity by pandering because it's not who you really are. And eventually that's going to come out. You're going to get sick of putting on this facade every time. Of course, yeah. 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 Speaking of maturity, do you, and this is kind of like wrapping us towards our towards our final question, but this is not that yet. Um, we've had a lot of guests on here, and particularly the ones who are who are more mature into their older years, um, <laughs> wise, wizened. Uh, we've spoken a lot about how hard youth can be. That mm-hmm. that that youth is a period characterized by by what we think is a lightness. Or, or something. I don't know w- what to call that. But actually, for the young people living through it, it can often be quite hard. Mm-hmm. I know for myself, I never felt lighter or younger than by the time I turned 30. Yeah. And that stayed with me through my 30s. I'm curious for you, you're kind of, you know, you're, you're in your later youth, but you're, you're young. You're very young. Maybe you don't have the perspective yet. Do you think that, that youth is hardest on the young? Do you, do you think it, do you, you know, and maybe it's going back into those earlier years you were talking about, but do I think youth is hardest? When no, not hardest. Is, is being young mm-hmm. actually hard in a way? No, I think the ignorance is so bliss. Mm, okay. You know, uh, I think we get set up poorly. Yes, with, I, with that's, that's it. Family, I, I agree. as an example, or education system. Like, Culture. we don't get prepared for. 90% of what being an adult is really like. Mm-hmm. Like, I'm me taking the risk to, to move to LA and and sleep on a couch for two years taught me so much. Like, you know, being thrown in the deep end, you had to learn how to swim immediately. Mm-hmm. Now I'll meet people my own age who have never even had to do that still. And I go, thank God I had to overcome that early. So now I, now I know how to be an adult, you know? Mm-hmm. So I think, I think we just don't get set up properly with the things we need to learn. And, and we can go as technical as taxes, you know? Mm-hmm. Most schools don't teach you how to deal with that kind of stuff. Yeah. You have no idea how to get a, you know, a primary care physician, which I still don't have. Right. <laughs> um, and then you can go back to, you know, pr- prominent uh, relationship figures. You know what I mean? So I think it's easy being young because you don't, you don't know what's ahead of you. Yeah, you, you don't know, know better in a way. You should enjoy. I am... I am so severely affected by nostalgic moments. Like if somebody mm-hmm. shows me, you know, a photo of what Christmas was like in 2002, I get so sad. And no. I miss so wait, it how old so were you much. In 2002? Oh, depending on the month, six or seven. Oh, mm. goodness, <laughs> wow. I miss that kind of stuff. Yeah. Because you, life was so simple. You thought school was your whole life. You mm-hmm. know, you, th- mm-hmm. that was. The biggest thing you had to overcome was like, oh, I had to get up early and I had to go learn about this stupid stuff I don't want to learn about. But like playing outside, you know, getting to enjoy your friends, watching TV, watching cartoons, mm. sleepovers, learning how to run up, ride a bike, all that kind of fun stuff. Now, when do you have time to ever do any of that stuff anymore? Mm. Well, well, you're very successful. So you can take vacations. Actually, I would say the last... Seven well, years you have a family been the busiest now. my life. Yeah, but that, that's because of family. It's, because yeah. it's, like, it's like that which would have otherwise been time off is completely not. <laughs> yeah, of course. But, but there's something about what you're saying where you, when you have children, you start to, it's not anywhere near as, um, it's not the same because you're not just living so purely, wholeheartedly through it as the child, but as a, as a parent witnessing a child you you're you're getting some new dimension to that. It's mm. very interesting. It, it's, yeah, it's like, it's not the same as being young, <laughs> but, yeah, of course. but it is, but it is, it is something. It also I feel think, like it would make you reflect a lot. No, mm-hmm. it does. And I, you know, the one period of like genuine nostalgia I have mm-hmm. is actually when I was uh, 18 and I read the entire Harry Potter series one Christmas. Nerd. Yeah. So here's the funny thing. Never interested in Harry Potter. But then I finally was like, all right, everybody is reading this uh-huh. mm-hmm. and seeing the movies. And I was like, I'm just going to read the whole thing. And I'll tell you what. I had I had two breakfasts every day when I did this. Um, I had just come home from my first show in New York City, so I had some money, and so I was like, I was going out to eat for mm-hmm. every single meal, um, but staying at my mom's and wearing sweatpants every day. And I tell you what, I finished the series, often reading by the lit Christmas tree, which is like so. Mm. That's so, so cute. I mean, Harry Potter. In by a lit Christmas the light tree, light yeah. of a lit Christmas oh, tree around course. Christmas. I mean, of come course, on. Yes. like there's yeah, nothing. Actually... Yeah, and I was not yet twenty. Like you know, yeah. I was. Still, I think I was eighteen. I might have been nineteen. Um, 
by the end of this stretch, I could no longer fit into pants that were not sweatpants. Of my, of, like they were just a little too. Are like, you oh, serious? Oh, there we go. That's the first time. You know. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> like I mean, I could fit into them, but they were not comfortable. And so yeah. I was like, okay, I gotta. I want to imagine that. you had the same committed epiphany when you discovered porn. You're like, well, everybody's watching it, and then cut to. I watched. I, I watched all 90 pages of Born Up under the Christmas tree. Actually, it's funny. I'm like the exact. I I had such an early relationship with porn. I dude, I have not watched porn in 10 years. Yeah. Matt's taking probably a picture more. of you to be Pro- like, this, this is a real person. <laughs> Yeah, are you gonna try and show me porn right now? I'm not gonna do it. I'm not. You're like, we're ending this right now, bro. It's Christmas. <laughs> Ten oh, years, yeah, it's over. Yeah. I got him to watch porn. Ben Bad, you pervert, everybody. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Ruined it. I'm sorry I made you watch porn, fam. No, it's you're fine. not it's sorry. Fine. That was, uh, a, that, was a little, that was a little icon. You didn't make me watch anything. I know, he actually has a burner uh, Reddit account. It's called Penhub. <laughs> uh, Matt. We have a final question we ask every guest, which is if you could go back and say something to 12-year-old Matt, what would you say? Leave your dick alone. (laughs) Why are you doing him like this, man? Relax. Okay, he's not going anywhere. Be nice to him. I know it's probably not as prophetic as, as, as most people come in here. And no, say, people are like, I wouldn't say anything, or I'd be like, you're going to be okay. So it was great. That's the first we time we've gotten that dick. answer. Say, you're going to be okay. <laughs> you're going to be all right. If you <laughs> stop. You're actually going to grow, believe it or not. <laughs> yeah. Things are going to get better. Okay. That's good. That's nice. Matt, thank you for coming. Dude, yeah, thank you so for much coming. For it was so nice me. to meet really. you, Matt. Now the pleasure to meet you. But don't worry about being canceled. You're going to be just fine. You're going to be all right. I'm the only one who has to worry about that. Yeah, yeah. You're going to be fine, dude. You're going to be, worst case scenario, you get to be the hottest substitute teacher yeah, on the East Coast, dude. Sure, Are yeah, you kidding yeah, me? Fair. You're going to be just yeah. fine. You're going to land on your feet, Ben.